Hi, I'm Jim Zogby and welcome to Viewpoint. The presidential nominating process officially got underway Monday night when Iowa held its first in the nation caucuses. 99 counties across the state, thousands of precincts and, uh, and literally hundreds of thousands of folks turned out there were some surprises. Uh, there were some upsets. Two candidates ended their campaigns, now three I think, and one contest was so close that some delegates had to be awarded uh, based on a coin flip. Here with an expert analysis of what's going on in this election and what we can expect to come is political journalist Kathy Keeley. She until recently was the Washington news director for Bloomberg and before that managing editor at Sunlight Foundation. She was also before that a managing editor at National Journal. Spent over a decade reporting on Congress and national politics for USA Today covered every major presidential campaign since 1980. And you were on the show when you were at the National Journal. My, I, I was. My, old, I've, I've my been, old show. I've been on this show in many incarnations, uh, both for you and for me. Um, let me start with Iowa. Um, it was an interesting contest. Uh, and I want to, if we could, kind of go through the, 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 the lineup. But just at the, sort of at the top, who was the biggest winner? Well, I would have to say Ted Cruz mm -hmm. was the biggest winner. Um, and of course, uh, he won, uh, but I think by beating expectations, he was by far the biggest winner. And then I would also say, uh, again, on the Republican side, um, Marco Rubio, mm. uh, by placing third and really making the strongest showing of those quote unquote establishment candidates. Yeah. Uh, so that gives him a big lift. And the biggest loser. Um, maybe Trump, yeah. uh, because he lost the expectations game. And then obviously I think there are some other people who have since gotten out of the race. Uh, Mike Huckabee, Rick Santorum, uh, Rand Paul, obviously, uh, they didn't, they, their showings were so poor that it led them to, to leave. But I would say of the candidates who were really contenders, uh, Trump, although yeah. I don't think that takes him out of the race. Let's start. I want to go down the, the, the list. Rubio. I heard his speech. Um, it was two speeches, and it's, I was struck by that. His, his sort of victory concession slash victory, it sort of become a, a, a so standard feature. I mean, President Obama's, uh, then candidate Obama's, uh, New Hampshire concession speech. I was there speech for that. It was actually amazing. became sort of the, I, I think, almost uh, as transformed by Will I Am became an anthem um, and m may have accounted for a significant part of his uh, catapulting of the campaign into the into the next round. There's an interesting story behind that speech that maybe some of the candidates could uh, take a moral uh, from and uh, it's it's interesting I was working uh, for USA Today during that campaign and I had been assigned to do a big feature story on Barack Obama that was going to be the cover of the uh, of the newspaper because the editors were convinced he was going to win New Hampshire and then party over for Hillary. So uh, I went and um, I worked on this story for a long time and I uh, then went, I was trying to get an interview and trying to get an interview with Obama and finally I did. It happened on the afternoon of primary day in New Hampshire and I went down and I met him and his press secretary at the hotel they were using for their headquarters and did this interview. And it must have been about four o'clock in the afternoon. It was mm -hmm. close enough to my deadline that I sat in the car outside and typed in my quotes. Um, but I kept thinking to myself at the time, uh, gee, I'm really glad I got this interview. My editors will really be happy about the quotes, but shouldn't you be out shaking hands or something? Uh, because I know Hillary is. And uh, sure enough, Hillary won that primary. And having talked to Obama that afternoon, I knew he was, he, that had to be a total surprise to him. He was completely confident he was going to win that election. And so several hours later, after my story was uh, tossed aside because it was no longer relevant, I was driving down to Nashua to cover that very speech. And you could have cut the gloom with a knife in the room. It was a high school gymnasium filled with Obama supporters, and they were so sad and downcast. 
And then he came in and rocked the house with that speech, uh, which was the first time he used the call and response, yes, we can. And I was just, it was an astonishing speech. And Made even more astonishing by Will I Am. Yes. I just was but it was an inspirational speech yeah, to his to supporters, yeah. whether they were Will I Am yeah. or the folks in yeah. this gym. Yeah. And but what was so interesting to me is months later, I was in Europe where uh, then candidate Obama was taking a tour of uh, European capitals. And uh, I covered his speech in Berlin. And because of the time difference, you actually could go and have a drink at the bar afterwards. We weren't working super late. And I ended up talking to one of Obama's speechwriters. And I asked him, I said, you know, I want to ask you about that speech in New Hampshire. Because I said, I interviewed him four hours before, and I know he thought he was going to win. How did you pull out that speech, that amazing speech, in such a short time? And the speechwriter said, it was the same speech. It was the speech Obama had intended to give as his victory speech. Mm -hmm. And he changed one line, which was to say, I want to congratulate my opponent, Hillary Clinton, on a great victory. Mm -hmm. But I think the I point is... i got to go back and listen to it again. He had a plan. Yeah. He had a script. One of the remarkable things about Barack Obama as a politician is his ability not to get rattled and not to let events take him off yeah. course. And I think uh, there are certainly a lot of candidates who could learn from that. Well, the thing about Rubio's speech was that it was two speeches. It was the inspirational piece at the end um, that was he's now being attacked by some of his opponents for sort of canned remarks. Then there was the upfront part that, that I want to ask you about because it was, I, I would say, mean spirited. Hillary Clinton, Clinton can't be president. She, she broke, broke, the, she's a criminal. She broke the law, whatever. And she, he went down the list of, of his opponents. Um, and I thought back and I said, um, John McCain never gave a speech like that. Mitt Romney didn't give a speech. George W. Bush didn't give a speech like that. And Bob Dole might have made mean comments, but they were always so cute that it didn't come off mean as much as it was just funny. It was like Johnny Carson late night uh, humor. Um, there's a lot of that in this Republican primary, mean digs and jabs. You might say Trump introduced it, but I don't think so. I mean, they've been going at each other all along the way. And that's different and new. And does it work? Well, we'll see. I think one of the interesting things about Rubio, um, as one of my colleagues at Bloomberg, uh, Sahil Kapoor, has pointed out, there's a, a, um, a bifurcation in that personality. He really sold himself and introduced himself to the national stage as a very optimistic, uh, future-oriented kind of guy. Um, and that was his message. Uh, he was having trouble getting traction in a field that, as you've pointed out, uh, is tapping much more into the anger in the electorate. And so he shifted his message. He hasn't entirely given up on the sunny optimism, uh, you know, which I think all politicians who do that are kind of... It was the of, second half of the speech. Yes. Yeah. But he is, uh, you know, it's kind of modeling yourself after Jack Kennedy, the new frontier, and we're going to yeah, look yeah, towards yeah. the future. Yeah. But I think... Uh, but I think what's happened here is that there's a real anger in the electorate. And I think some of these candidates are trying, feeling that, that expressing that or echoing it is the mm. way to win. And we will see how, how that it works. It came off to me so awkward that it was almost schizophrenic. It was too, that, what you're saying explains it, that the, the second half was the, the speech he started with. Right. And then the first half was, this is what I got to do to keep this crowd happy. I think um, that's exactly right. Cruz intrigues me because he has fashioned himself the evangelical. Um, the question is, does he become another Huckabee and Santorum that wins the 60 plus percent of Iowa evangelical voters uh, and then fades quickly? Um, or can he remake himself? I mean, Cruz started with uh, uh, his speech with a to God be the glory, and Ruby a couple of times referred to Jesus as our Savior. Um, that works in Iowa. I don't think it works everywhere else. Tell me a little about how Cruz goes to New Hampshire and beyond. Well, I think Cruz uh, 
New Hampshire is not going to be Cruz's state. Mm -hmm. um, so he's there, um, but I think that the interesting thing will be to watch how he does in South Carolina and beyond. Um, he is definitely, the interesting thing about Cruz is he also started out with a slightly different message. Cruz is really a um, strict constitutionalist uh, uh, Tea Party kind of guy and uh, very limited government. That's really uh, where his sweet spot is. That's what he likes to mm -hmm. talk about. Um, I think he's appealed more and more to the evangelicals. Obviously, that's a smart strategy in Iowa because that's a huge proportion of the Republican caucus vote. Uh, more than 50 percent uh, are self-described. This election was 60, yeah. 64. It's a huge number, always in Iowa. And so, uh, clearly, that was a strategic move. Um, I'm not, that's not to say that he doesn't sincerely believe those things, but he was certainly emphasizing it more. I think the question will be, as he moves into other states, how much does he emphasize that? And then beyond that, I think the conundrum for him is the general election. Um, how do you, with a message like that, which may be quite successful with uh, Republican primary and caucus voters, uh, how do you succeed in the, in the general where you have to appeal to a more centrist vote? Uh, Trump. The interesting thing about Donald Trump is that from the very beginning, uh, he was counted out, and after every flub that he'd make at a debate or uh, some comment that was just outrageous, that the undoing of Donald Trump, it wasn't Trump that was underestimated, it was the electorate that wanted to hear what Donald Trump said. And almost like the superhero Sandman, the more that they punched him, the stronger he got. But can he sustain a loss um, and, and another loss if he loses New Hampshire? I mean, if this catapults others in, into the forefront? I mean, how, how strong is that uh, support among an electorate that wants somebody who strikes out and, in anger uh, if he doesn't win with it? And will, can others absorb that anger and become victorious? Well, those are all really good questions. I think, um, in a way, uh, Trump kind of beat himself in Iowa by, um, by making himself and others believe he could win it. Uh, I think that was always going to be a tough state for him because... Yeah, when you go to put m money when they pass the communion plate, and you go to put money on the plate, it doesn't quite work as a good evangelical, right? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and so I think, but even that, I think people <coughs> were willing to, I think, I think the thing about Trump that uh, for his supporters, he can break rules because he's so, uh, he's so outrageous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when uh, I was in Texas uh, working for the Houston Post and uh, Charlie Wilson, who represented this Bible Belt district kept getting reelected over and over again, even though he had a new girlfriend every week and mm -hmm. uh, led this totally outrageous lifestyle. But he mm -hmm. provided good constituent service, and we always used to joke, but I think it was in some ways true, that Charlie's constituents got to live vicariously through him. Mm -hmm. And there's some sense of that, I think, with Trump. People, uh, they, he's tapping into this anger. Uh, the more outrageous he gets, the more people are thinking, that'll show those people who aren't paying attention to us. And, um, and so I think he can continue to defy the rules. And I think the reason, you know, again, he kind of, uh, he made his own bed in Iowa by suggesting he could win. He made a good try. Um, but really the fact that he didn't win Iowa isn't surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like he will win in New Hampshire. Um, and then the question is, can he sustain that? Yeah. And then I think for the Republican Party, and this is why people are so concerned, is could he really win a, a general election? One-fifth of Republicans say they won't vote for Donald Trump if he's the nominee, and one-fifth of Republicans say they won't vote for anybody but Donald Trump. Yeah. He, he has created a problem for the, the party, no doubt. Definitely. Let's go to the Democratic side. Bernie Sanders was down 40 points about three months ago in Iowa. He ties. It is a tie. I mean, yeah, sure, she, she got four more delegates out of a thousand plus, but six of those were decided by a coin toss. Um, and Chuck Todd said the other day that it's 
the odds of winning six coin tosses in a row are one out of 64,000. Yeah. It's pretty good odds. Uh, I'd check the coin out if I, if I were Bernie. But, but in any case, it was a tie. Um, does Bernie lose Iowa? Did he lose Iowa? Did he have to win? You know, I mean, how, how she's playing it as a win, and I'm not quite sure it's a win. No, I think that's a win for Bernie yeah. uh, because he uh, he certainly beat expectations in Iowa, and as you pointed out, he came from nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think again, uh, the question though is Iowa and New Hampshire are quirky states, and uh, and in New Hampshire he's got a built-in advantage by being a neighbor and somebody who's very well known in the state. I think the question for Sanders is. Uh, can he sustain this outside of those two states where, you know, when you get outside, uh, the first three or four states are special cases, but especially New Hampshire and Iowa where there's so much concentration on those states uh, for such a, a, an extended period of time and the candidates spend so much time there and they do so much retail that it really enables an underdog to succeed, and I think the voters in those states kind of like to shake up the race, and uh, and they like to go with underdogs. But once you get past, certainly um, South Carolina and Nevada, but even once you leave New Hampshire, it becomes a very different campaign. It's much more a campaign of TV ads and airport tarmacs and uh, big national strategy. So I, I think the question is, how much can he sustain that appeal? Now, having said that, I think you know Barack Obama proved uh, that it's now possible to raise lots of money from small donors, that it's possible to build momentum and to sustain it, um, and that you don't have to be the top dog to win the race. But I think, uh, I think the question here is, and we've also seen, I think, a history in the, in the Republic of people kind of going with that outlier candidate to send a message and, and, and then that's what kind I wanted of to ask you about off. because Hillary Clinton is strong but I think there's no doubt that she's wounded I mean I was looking at the the entrance polls they didn't do exit polls they did entry polls and um, among those who say I want a candidate I can trust Bernie wins by 73 points um, she's not trusted and She's not viewed as authentic. And I'm not quite sure in some cases I tried to parse out the Bernie uh, uh, appeal. 74-year-old um, grumpy grandfather. Um, it's weird that kids were falling in love with him. I think it had less to do with the message in some instances as it did with the sheer authenticity of, of the guy. I mean, he was right out there in your face and he was real. Um, what does she do now? I mean, do, do, does she limp through to, to victory? Um, is there space for somebody else to get into this thing? Or are we going to see this, this sort of odd couple fight it out now for the next several months? Well, I think, I don't know <clears throat> that, I mean, I think, I, I think the jury's still out because I think once you get into South Carolina and then the southern states, I think, you know, if, if Hillary starts to roll and get momentum, uh, then I think, you know, that the, this moment has passed. So I think that that question still remains to be answered. I think um, on the question of the authenticity, I will say that uh, I'm a little bit sympathetic to women politicians mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's, there's only one woman politician I can think of who I covered who was able to get away with being quirky and loudmouthed, and that's Ann Richards. Uh, women always have to fit into a kind of a cookie cutter and, and be less risk takers. Uh, it's very, very hard, uh, you know, it's, it's unimaginable for a woman whose hair was as flyaway as Bernie's to, uh, to win a political office, that's why I don't run. But, um, but I think, uh, so I think there's, there's a built-in problem there for uh, for a woman politician, we haven't really gotten to that point yet where we allow women to be as authentic as men. And then I think for, um, 
uh, Hillary Clinton the very thing that makes her in some ways a very appealing and good candidate, which is that uh, knockout resume she's got, mm -hmm. uh, is also an albatross in a year when people are very, very angry with established authority of any kind, including the media, and, uh, and are looking for a way to, to express that anger. And, and Bernie becomes a, a perfect channel for that. Martin O'Malley uh, resume. It's a good one. Yeah, um, very good. And didn't catch on at all and, uh, and ducked out at the end. Smart, I think, that he left. Why do you think he didn't catch on at all? I think that's a great question. I think it's hard to be um, the middle-aged white guy, even if you've got great guns, you know, those great pictures of him playing the guitar, um, in a year when you're running against a candidate uh, in Hillary Clinton who could make history. And then you have this candidate who, you know, even though O'Malley, I would say, positioned himself more to the left, uh, the Clinton and the Sanders campaigns are each offering a political revolution of a sort. Um, she would be the first woman president, and then Sanders actually says, I want a revolution. So I think it's, it's hard to be the sort of uh, more conventional character in that mix, and mm -hmm. this was just not his year. The three guys on the Republican side I want to I wanna talk about, um, Kasich being one, uh, and then Christie and Bush. They're the last three of the mix who have a chance in New Hampshire. Um, Kasich seems to be doing fairly well in some polls. Um, none of them did well in Iowa. Um, wh who do you think of the three of them could emerge as the establishment alternative? Because I'm not quite sure that Rubio fits that bill right now. Yeah, it's really hard to say. I think, um, I think a lot of people look at Rubio as somebody who has crossover appeal, who can mm -hmm. get both sides of the party. Um, among the three you talked about, and they all have invested very heavily in New Hampshire, uh, it's, it's really hard to say. I mean, Bush has the money. He still has a bigger war chest than anyone when you count his super PACs. Um, and Christie, I think a lot of uh, Republican establishment types I've talked to really still hold out hope for him because they think he's kind of Trump without the... Uh, the baggage. Uh, he's the outspoken guy, but um, but a little has the government experience. And then Kasich, I think Kasich is um, he's very genuine. Um, he's certainly got a an impressive resume. Um, but the question is, he's he's quirky. He's going to appeal to kind of he has almost kind of a he's the 2016 appeal. compassionate conservative. Exactly, conservative, exactly. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays yeah. in uh, Flinty, New Hampshire. Um, I, I want to go to the 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 two parties now. Um, talk about wounded. I think that we're seeing fracturing on both sides. Um, there is a. Uh, an opening, and your former boss, Mike Bloomberg, uh, seemed to indicate that he might want to do it. What would it take, do you think, um, would it depend who the nominees are uh, to determine whether or not a third, third party candidate gets in? Um, and is a third party candidate capable of healing the partisan divide? Because that, that I think, is, is, is a big issue. Anyone who's in the field right now, whether it's Bernie or, or Hillary or uh, Marco Rubio or, or, or the Donald or uh, Cruz would only exacerbate the partisan divide. I mean, I think that's very clear. Um, and they could win and their parties would be happy with a, a win, but nothing more is going to get done in the next four years than was done in the last eight. And, and so that, that's the question I have. Could somebody outside come in and heal it or would they be a perpetual outsider? I don't. I don't know. I think the question is, are we seeing the end of one or both of the parties as we know them? My brother says America needs a third party, a Republican party. Yeah, or you, you've almost got a split in, in the Republican party and, and to some extent too in the Democratic party mm -hmm. between the governing and wings of the party, the people who believe that there's still a reason to act practically and try to get a compromise, mm -hmm. and then the people who are uh, just blow the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. And and so I really wonder if, you know, I started to think about, and I would talk about this with other people in the newsroom, <coughs> that if uh, if you had 
uh, Donald Trump and Ted Cruz at the head of the Republican ticket, could you see it's something like what happened in France where the right and the left came together to block Le Pen and see mm -hmm. it like a Joe Biden, Nikki Haley ticket or mm -hmm. something like that. I mean, it's far-fetched, but I do wonder if we're getting to the point where the parties have existed so long in their current configuration, uh, the ideologies they represent are kind of creaky, post-World War II, it, they kind of fit a post-World War II world that doesn't exist anymore. So I think the bigger question, I don't know whether the United States will ever have a multiplicity of parties, but could the two-party system that we have, could those two parties kind of rebrand themselves or one be replaced by something different? You know, we didn't always have Republicans and Democrats. So I, I just wonder if we're at that point in our politics, and I think that's one of the things that I'm going to be watching as the year unfolds. I think it's possible. And, and to, going back to the partisan divide, the, the, the bickering in Washington, um, at the end of the day, that seems to me to be the determinant almost as to how this election comes out. Is there anyone in the mix who can um, make a difference in Washington, or do we simply get, and I, I, I said last uh, eight years, actually it's been much longer than that. It goes back to the Gingrich era. It, it, it's really a, it's something that's been long in the making. I think what it's going to take to change that is um, a greater involvement um, by citizens. Uh, there's been a lot written about how gerrymandering uh, contributes to this, how the, our fundraising system contributes to the polarization. There's a lot of things going here, but the biggest thing is people not voting, mm -hmm. not voting for Congress, not voting in the primaries. Um, people seem to think, you know, I teach college students and you know, I asked a bunch of them after the first Obama election, it was 2010, and I said, well, how many of you have gotten your absentee ballots for your uh, local congressional elections? None of them. How many of you voted in the, in the presidential election? All of them. And, you know, voting for president isn't enough. I mean, just ask anybody who's ever been president how hard it is to get anything done. And by the way, that's the way it's supposed to be in our system. Uh, checks and balances, but if you don't vote in primaries and you don't vote in congressional elections, you're tying the hands of the person you mm. voted for for president. And so I think until we really, um, as a nation, understand that democracy is a participatory sport, how lucky we are to have the ability to participate in it and and be willing to get informed and care enough to get out there and and be on the field, mm -hmm. uh, it's this problem is not going to get solved. I just spent last week in uh, Iowa, and then I went to Chicago for a couple of events, and I thought to myself, um, as I've often thought, I would love to live my life in Iowa uh, because the caucuses are just stunning as political activity. I mean, it's just it, people are professionals about the game; they know just how to do it. And then when I die, I want to get buried in Chicago so I could keep voting. Can you can vote again? Just yes, I like that. Uh, thank you so much for <laughs> You're joining very us, welcome. Kathy. That's all the time we've got. You can follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA or check out our website, AAIUSA.org. And on the website, you'll find the positions of the candidates on some key issues involving Middle East and civil liberties. Um, we've been tracking all of them, and even those who've dropped out, take a look. Thanks for watching. See you next week on Viewpoint. Mm -hmm.